All right. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the 30 June 2022 edition of the Technical Steering Committee of the Hyperledger um, Hyperledger Technical Steering Committee. Let me get a uh, screen ready. Oh, there we go. So um, as we preface in all of our meetings, there are two rules. Uh, the first one is the antitrust rule. Um, Linux Foundation wants to make sure everything is legal. And if it's not legal, it doesn't happen in this meeting. Um, so that's a nice quick summary of the antitrust policy. Um, if it's not legal, it shouldn't happen anyway, but especially in this meeting. Um, the second rule is uh, non-legal things, and that is the code of conduct. Um, we all need to be nice to each other. All are welcome here. We need to make sure everyone feels like they um, have a space here if they want to show up and participate. So those are the two ground rules uh, for all of our meetings. So we will go into um, our announcements. Um, first, the Dev Weekly newsletter. It goes out every week. If you have any developer information that you would like shared to a developer community, um, there is a link you can leave a comment um, on the wiki page. Um, the target of this is developers. So it's a great place to get for them to read it. Um, the second big announcement um, is that the Hyperledger Global Forum is going to be happening 12 to 14 September. And last week, the schedule was released. So you can look at the schedule and see when people are speaking. Um, and see what talks have made it, and you can outline your schedule for where you want to go. Um, any other announcements from anyone else in the uh, on the call that they want to make at this point? All right, seeing none. Um, quarterly reports. We had two quarterly reports. They were both due last week. They both came in about a day or two late. Um, so if you could please review those. Um, I don't know if there's been any comments on either one of them. Nothing on Besu and nothing on Caliper that I see. We don't have too much adoption, too much uh, reviews on that. So um, please read, read these uh, project reviews. If you have any questions, uh, leave, a, um, leave a comment in there um, and we'll get to it. There are no reports due next week. But there are reports, uh, oh wait, next week's seventh. They are due next week. I can't read correctly. <laughs> there was no reports due this week, but there are reports due next week. Hyperledger Cactus and Hyperledger Fabric. I'm getting my calendar messed up in my head all wrong. So next week, um, yeah. Any other questions about reports or uh, announcements before we go on to the presentation? All right. So for this week's meeting, we're going to start off with a presentation from Matt Nelson. He's uh, he's from Consensus, um, working on the Ethereum um, clients there, uh, Chekou and Besu. And he's going to give a presentation for us outlining uh, details of the uh, Ethereum merge that is um, coming up when it's ready. So uh, let's see. Do I need to give you any privileges, Matt? Do I need to let you share the screen? Let's yeah, see. look. Um... I should be sharing now. Can everyone see? Yep, you, you're, we see it. Awesome. All right, I'll, I'll be brief. Um, again, thanks Thanks for the floor here. And I just want to give a quick update around kind of more broadly what the merge uh, means for Besu and for Ethereum at large uh, and how kind of the, the Besu team is, is working kind of across uh, the community to, to really be ready for the merge and make sure that it's a really big success um, for you know all parties, but also getting kind of the participation of some of the you know the users in the community users of Base who really excited around mainnet. So that's kind of the purpose of this presentation. Um, but you know to reiterate here that we we see that Ethereum is leading blockchain technology in both adoption and activity at this time, um, and and a lot of this is happening, of course, on those public networks. So we're really excited to see kind of the merge drive interest in public networks um, and continue to add more users, developers, and open the door for enterprises and institutions to jump on board. Um, but at this time, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing a ton of, of active developers in the community, um, though these are not all client, blockchain client developers, like those who might build a, a blockchain client like Besu. Uh, we're seeing a ton of active de developers across decentralized applications, across client teams, and across, you know, kind of new paradigms in Web3. So we're really very excited around the kind of growth of developers um, and, you know, we're seeing a ton of different uh, transactions and a ton of different assets that are kind of moving around on chain uh, and in different kind of protocols, whether those are DeFi, 
or other stable coins kind of really picking up speed and, and seeing adoption despite kind of the market conditions at this point. Um, but we're really excited again around kind of the, the adoption of these public networks and kind of what's next for Ethereum here. And it, what we see is something formerly known as Ethereum 2.0, um, which is kind of a, a, a set of design upgrades for the protocol itself with a bunch of different goals uh, that have kind of been broken up piecemeal and the first of those large major changes is the merge. Uh, so the merge, of course, is some an, a process that's going to be happening uh, over the next couple of months. Uh, there is no specific date. It is kind of based on the community consensus around every when everything is ready, when the client teams are ready. But its goals are built specifically around these kind of four pillars as we see it, uh, but at the same time, building a more sustainable and easy to use Ethereum where creators and infrastructure providers and enterprises can confidently innovate uh, on kind of public networks. So the, the four pillars as we see them, the merge is focused around four key things here. So our first pillar is around diversity and openness. We're looking to make Ethereum a much more robust network by providing a diversity of clients. And when I say client, I mean node software, things that let you connect to the network. Um, and this diversity is really key because as we move to the proof of stake system, we're looking to have a robust decentralized network and we're having more technologies like Besu step into that kind of niche in order to provide that network security. So previously there were super majorities. There were a lot of different kind of uh, client softwares that were focused only around specific implementations. And now we're looking to capitalize on this merge to bring in more things like, like base you to the forefront here. Um, the second pillar around energy efficiency, this is the key one that we're kind of signaling to the market is that Ethereum is moving away from that costly kind of proof of work mining and moving towards a consensus mechanism based on economic stake. Uh, and this will again, re reduce that energy efficiency around 99% upwards, which really means that the kind of Ethereum network itself is, is open for business. It's not necessarily a PR nightmare to transact on Ethereum. And we want to get enterprises interested in the kind of next generation of creators and Web3 value on this network because of this ener energy efficiency. It's a really great gateway for these kind of new developers and experimentation with the network itself. The third pillar here is that the merge is intended to transition seamlessly from what we have today. Uh, the metaphor that I like to, he to hear, or that I hear a lot that I like is that you're basically replacing a gasoline engine uh, with an electric engine in a vehicle while you're driving down the freeway. And the reason we say this is because we're using a lot of the same components to make the merge happen uh, that we were using previously. So like I had mentioned, there's execution uh, clients like Besu, which are being run today. They're using proof of work mining. And when the merge happens, they'll seamlessly switch over to the proof of stake mechanism. They'll connect to some new techno technology components, but we're, we're using a lot of the same components. We're using a lot of the same APIs to provide a seamless developer experience and to reduce kind of the moving parts. So we're really excited for the fact that developers and institutions that get involved will have the same experience on mainnet for the most part, pre and post merge. So we're really trying to build confidence in developers and in partners to create a good developer experience. And, and a lot of that comes down to the fact that, that these different teams and researchers have worked really hard to make sure that what we have today is still valuable tomorrow. Uh, and the fourth one is around kind of a lot of the crypto economics of, of Ether itself and public networks and how the consensus mechanism works around proof of stake. But the net with this one is, is that the, you know, the changes that, that, that are being made at the protocol level will make the currency a lot more robust. Uh, it'll make it a lot more, deflationary and there'll be different security guarantees that are built into the consensus mechanism, which will hopefully engender more trust uh, with developers, with users and with institutions that are looking to get involved in some of these um, different protocols built on top of Ethereum. And a lot of these kind of uh, changes are not limited to Ethereum. And the fact of the matter is that kind of the, the Ethereum virtual machine or EVM is you know, gobbling up a lot of the blockchain world here. And we're seeing that, you know, across all these different networks, we have EVM compatible public chains that will hopefully all benefit from this merge to proof of stake. So it's really a proliferation of, you know, benefits across the ecosystem that we're really excited to, you know, evangelize and bring out to the public and talk more with businesses about and how that could impact uh, their, their innovation with blockchain and with Web3 tech. So 
The roadmap is on schedule for 2022. Like I had mentioned, this is kind of a little bit of a zoom in on what the, is happening technically with the merge. So today we have, of course, the Ethereum proof of work chain as it stands. Uh, that is what's running in kind of the production peer-to-peer uh, -peer network today. So nodes run, they, they mine blocks and they include transactions and that all runs well and good until we have the merge here. In tandem with the proof of work network that we have today, we also have a beacon chain running which is essentially kind of a, a, a network that sits to the left of that proof of work network. It's to test out the implementation of all of those proof of stake kind of components. Uh, so, you know, making sure that the stakes are secured, uh, making sure that the, the technology that runs the validators is secured and that the consensus mechanisms work correctly. When we experience the merge, those kind of two separate layers will become one and will shut off proof of work We'll use the beacon chain to run the consensus mechanism of the network, and we'll continue to use the technology, those Ethereum one clients, to run execution on the new chain. And when I say execution, I mean things like executing smart contracts or building blocks and, and talking about those blocks with other folks in the network, peer-to-peer uh, -peer networking, keeping track of things like the world state and syncing. So the execution clients like Basu are still very important, uh, but they, you know, they they will be thankfully running a much cheaper consensus mechanism thanks to those beacon clients and beacon chain uh, which will allow us again to kind of get all the benefits of proof of stake and shut off the costly proof of work so our key goal here was is obviously sustainability but it also sets up a lot of the other next generation of upgrades with ethereum and it also helps us to uh, improve kind of scalability in some other means so you might have heard of roll-up technology or layer two roll-ups uh, this move to the beacon chain kind of consolidates a lot of these outstanding challenges and hopefully makes things a little more consistent around scaling. And then, you know, after this, I won't get too deep into this uh, due to the interest of time. Uh, there are a lot of protocol upgrades planned around data availability, which should help scaling as well. This date is definitely not going to be happening, but it's a, uh, a good barometer. And there's more details here. I'll share these slides. You can follow these links and get a little bit more background there. So where do we specifically come in with Basu and the merge? So as I had mentioned before, it's an execution client. And what that means is that it's part of the node infrastructure that will run post-merge. And it's kind of a key component here. So this big black and white box is what you'll need to run a node on Ethereum mainnet going forward. Uh, the node will require you to run a consensus client like Teku or like Prism or Lighthouse, some of these ETH2 clients. And then it'll re require you to run an execution client like Basu, or if you've heard of other clients like Geth or Nethermind, these are all execution layer clients. And they talk to each other via this engine API, which is kind of a, a really great uh, invention that allows specifically the reuse of these execution clients. So people can get you know, functionality that they're familiar with. As I mentioned, the developer experience is, is pretty seamless around this. And this somewhat slash mostly invisible API really manages the heavy lifting between the kind of new components of proof of stake. And at the end of the day, the user gets a new API to interact with the consensus client. They have the same exact JSON RPC API that they expect today with a few different options here and there. And then there is, of course, the networking between the other nodes. So Basu, you know, is, is really managing that execution layer. It's executing the transactions, updating the world state. It's still a very key component of the infrastructure but it allows us to be a lot more kind of modular and fle flexible as we shut off some of those proof of work related components. Um, and then here the engine API is basically a new set of APIs to enable maximum reuse of technology. Uh, and again, allows us to keep Basu as a key part of the stack because it really offloads only what is necessary to that consensus client to keep everything as lightweight as possible. So why change, you know, why change Basu to kind of meet where this is going as opposed to continuing down the road that we've been down? And the answer was that we want to both refine our mission and make sure that we are up to date with the spec of the merge and kind of capitalize on this opportunity to get Basu in the hands of more users. So with you know testing the merge, we've seen a lot of adoption of Basu. Uh, as I had mentioned, there's initiatives around client diversity to prevent bugs, to prevent challenges within the network. That can be uh, that can arise due to more than a certain portion of the network using one technology. So right now on the execution layer, as it's called, Basu sits at around three to four percent of the total network nodes. Whereas some Geth, the majority client, is you know fluctuates anywhere from sixty to eighty percent. 
And that's a number that we ideally want to get to around 20% per client. So we're looking to kind of capitalize on these diversity initiatives to really make base a key part of the, the proof of stake validator stack uh, and that kind of client combo that I had mentioned on the previous slide. So we're following the Ethereum specification and maintaining compatibility with mainnet, but we're kind of looking how we can prioritize at enterprise shift to public networks, uh, bringing institutional features to the public networks, focusing on security on mainnet, simplifying things like staking and interacting with the network, and you know, post-merge kind of focusing on what's next around performance, resolving some of the tech debt that we have, and thinking through modularization. So that's kind of you know, a, a term that's thrown around a lot, but right now we have things around basic plugins, and we're looking to explore how we can really open the client up to kind of a multi-chain world. And ultimately the goal I think is around network participation. So Ethereum clients are made, or what rather, these node client softwares are, are made to allow you to participate in networks. And those networks could be a variety of different things. Right now, today, it's a public network or a private network even um, when you're running you know, private nodes and you have privacy and permissioning using Besu. And even things like hybrid networks where we have the Palm network, which uses uh, bridges to make sure that a sidechain can, can port back to the Ethereum mainnet and vice versa. So really, we're looking to enable network participation with Besu. And I think that this kind of uh, change to the structure has allowed us to reevaluate re how Besu connects to different components, how it works with things like a consensus client. And in, I think that in the future, it'll allow us to kind of aim at kind of a multi-chain world. So whether that means other EVM compatible chains, uh, things like roll-up technology, where Besu could become an execution engine for layer twos, or just continuing to proliferate in hybrid networks with things like Palm. We're really looking to kind of refine our mission around network participation and giving enterprises the best tools and kind of implementations to work with this for their infrastructure. So, you know, it again, we, we continue to prov provide a familiar licensing, a familiar programming language and institutional grade feature for running low overhead nodes, ultimately for staking ether and interacting with blockchain networks. And today that's a variety of networks. It's not just public Ethereum, and we're, we're really pleased with that. And we want to continue those trends to have Besu enable, you know, participation with blockchain networks across the board. Uh, we want to be the best and most flexible infrastructure provider for institutions looking to participate in these blockchain networks, whatever they may be uh, in whatever form, um, you know, and, and, and seeing how we can kind of enable that new refinement of this mission. What does this mean for enterprise and what does specifically Ethereum participation mean for enterprise on public networks? So, you know, broad strokes, public network participation is rewarding. Uh, not only can institutions looking to get in involved with public networks learn a lot more quickly about how blockchain and distributed ledger technology works, they can learn to operate their node infrastructure. They will literally help with the security of the network. Um, we've seen some large institutions getting involved in staking uh, to, you know, to help with the security of Ethereum and, you know, stand up hundreds of, of nodes in order to, whoops, in order to get rewarded, but also to help with network security. So they're, they're gaining, you know, staking rewards around something around 12% post-merge on their initial stake. Um, there's lower rewards now, and those numbers will go down as rewards or as more and more people join the network. But, you know, it is, a re it is financially and educationally rewarding to get participated, and it provides new opportunities. Like I had mentioned before, proof-of-stake Ethereum is, is a sustainable, scalable technology, you know, network layer, and it's open for business. There's not much of a PR nightmare around deploying applications on a proof of work network once we flip proof of work off and we're very excited about that and we're hoping that more and more enterprise can capitalize on that kind of uh, pr change in order to get involved in public network ethereums as as we shed this you know boogeyman of of carbon you know emissions and all the all the negativity that comes there and lastly it provide public networks provide really interesting and new ways of interacting with these financial and cryptographic primitives, launching distributed apps, doing business with self sovereign users and accessing liquidity and services with DeFi. And really what this is to say is that there's a lot of interesting and novel things happening on public networks. And since all of it is done for the most part on chain, a lot of these components can be mixed and matched. They can be combined together. And it allows for the institutions to experiment in really you know, novel and unique ways. So we want folks to not only can participate in these kind of private network consortium fashions, but explore what it would look like to port some of the business to public networks. 
and to interact with a, a new set of users, to interact with a new set of um, you know, applications, and to see how all those components work together. Ultimately, what we're trying to say is that enterprises should feel safe and secure participating in public networks. And I think that where you know, Hyperledger and, and this group gets, gets involved is, is spreading these messages that I had mentioned in the slide deck, talking about education, provide education around staking, business and apps on public networks, and talking to enterprises and institutions about what their requirements might look like on public networks. Um, there's more details to come on these workshops. I'm hoping that we can, you know, solidify some stuff going forward and get the, you know, kind of the, the energy of this group behind it. Um, but again, we really want this message to hit home that enterprises can feel safe and secure participating in public networks and that there are opportunities in doing so. Uh, and that, of course, Besu remains, uh, for the most part, the same Ethereum client that they know today, but is gaining a bunch of new functionality uh, when it comes to the merge around participating in public networks. And that we will, of course, you know, be kind of focusing on this as we look to the future and, and continuing to follow the Ethereum public specification and continuing to watch the ecosystem evolve so that Basu can stay at the leading edge of these, you know, these clients and making sure that we're providing new use cases and new functionality that infrastructure providers and enterprises are looking for. So as I mentioned, more details not only to come around the topic of this presentation, but also to come around workshops and, and where we see kind of Basu evolving in the short term. Uh, and then in the medium term, of course, post-merge. Uh, but with that, I will take a very deep breath and pause for questions. I know I breezed through the first couple of slides. So if you have general questions around the merge, feel free to let me know. Um, and you know, my email is also in this deck, which will be likely shared. So feel free to, to go there. I don't know how much time I have left, uh, Dana, but. <laughs> as much time as we need. Aaron's already got his hand up. Hey, Matt. Um... Thanks for the great presentation. So I have one probably basic question and, and trying to understand and where this is coming from, right? So um, the preliminary question that I have is to understand. So what I understand right now is Beso is moving into a modularized architecture where it will be the consensus part of it would be split up into its own engine where the execution engine would interact with it. And um, are you going to uh, continue maintaining those existing uh, consensus engines as part of Hyperledger Foundation, or like what does what does that roadmap for those look like apart from the execution engine itself? Yeah, absolutely. So we have no plans to deprecate any of the existing consensus modes, um, and what that means is that when you want to participate in any given network, you basically just have to if you're if you're looking to use public Ethereum when you specify the network name in the kind of base genesis file, it'll force you to kind of set up another node in order to sync with the network, right? So it really depends on the network that you're connecting to. We're not looking to deprecate any features. We're going to continue to keep even mining in the code base. So that if you're looking to work with Ethereum Classic, for example, you can still use base as a client that will be able to mine on those networks. And we're going to continue to keep our, our private network consensus mechanisms as well. We're not looking to deprecate any of those. Um, we are just looking to shift kind of our focus on, on a modular set of features around this new set of functionality that is being introduced. However, we're not removing any of the previous functionality. And as I had mentioned, these changes are being done in such a way that is very delicate to the client. So there is not really a need for us to refactor the code base around kind of the merge, so to say. We simply plug into that engine API and the, the magic of kind of the two clients talking to each other and you know, pointing them to Ethereum mainnet does the rest of the work. So thankfully, we don't have to upend any of the existing private network functionality we have or existing mining network functionality. We're simply adding additional options that make use of that great kind of modular architecture that the merge has been built around uh, to, to make all that stuff work. Thanks, Mark. Awesome. I see we have Angelo with a question here. Yes, thank you, Matt. Very interesting, uh, very interesting uh, uh, presentation. By the way, I'm, I'm at, the, at the summer school, a blockchain summer school, where I was teaching, and there, there were discussion also about that there, is, there are people from the Ethereum Foundation, and they were, they were also discussing or presenting this kind of roadmap. Very interesting. I have three questions, if I may. Um, can you argue about these uh, three topics? Uh, um, why is not on the table uh, the option of moving the EVM uh, to uh, 
the blockchain systems like Algorand and Cardano, which are already proof of stakes, very well known, very well tested. Uh, Algorand even solves the trilemma. Second question, what happened to the, the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance specification? Uh, is that dead or is still alive? Third, uh, third question, how do you solve uh, for the business, for the enterprises who want to use the, the, public, uh, uh, the public blockchains, how do you solve the problem of predictability of costs, given the fluctuations that the, uh, the, the cryptocurrency might have? Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'll start with your first question around the EVM. Um, so frankly, Dano would be a great person to answer that question, but we've already done a lot of work to kind of modularize the EVM as a component itself. So as I had mentioned in the slide about refining the kind of the mission, we, we are looking actively at seeing where that might be useful. Um, you know, it, the Beisu team is not ignorant to the fact that there are other networks besides Ethereum with different components, different, uh, you know, benefits and, and pros and cons, et cetera, et cetera. And there are a lot of those based around the EVM. So we're looking to, of course, explore what that looks like. You know, we do have EVM implementations of Beisu that are not for public Ethereum, um, which I think is fantastic. And we're looking to, as we modularize the client even further in the post-merge kind of phase, we're going to definitely kind of explore how that looks from a priorities perspective so that we can enable those other chains. Uh, I'll let Dano chime in here for sure. And then I'll go to your second question. So as far as uh, migrating to other chains, um, one of the reasons why we can't go to Algorand and what's the other one that was Cardano or Tezos um, there are existing applications working on the Ethereum chain. So the desire to take it from proof of work to proof of stake, we're also at the same time keeping those applications running, um, large DeFi trading operations, games, um, distributed autonomous organizations. Those are all live on Ethereum and you can't, it's, you, it's not really easy to just simply move it from one major chain to another major chain. So that's one, one, one reason why it's not just going to Algorand or or Tezos or Cardano, um, apart from also the issues of, of ownership of Ether and uh, economics. Um, but a second thing I wanna point out there is there are chains that are adding EVM compatibility layers or directly integrating the EVM into their chains. Um, the work I did with modularizing the uh, EVM in Basu, so it's a separate includable library that doesn't bring along the rest of Basu with it, is something we're using in Hyperledger, uh, not Hyperledger, <laughs> too many H words, is something we're using in Hedera. So we're using that library in Hedera to provide our EVM um, operations in that. Now that's always been an EVM chain for the smart contracts. But I think a more interesting example would be Moonbeam network and uh, Aurora, which runs on the near network. Um, the base networks on both of those are not EVM based chains, but they have a compatibility layer on top of it that provide the EVM compatibility. So this vision is playing out. It's just not always with basic software. I think Moonbeam's written in Rust um, and I'm not sure what Aurora is written in. So the idea of putting EVM on other existing chains, is, is public chains, is very much happening, and I think there's a lot of um, industry pressure to make it happen. Um, I personally would compare the EVM and the JSON RPC interface to the IBM PC compatible world of the 80s computers. I mean, whether you're using Compaq or whether you're using HP or whether you're using an IBM underneath it, you still have the same APIs and it still works the same. So I think uh, the next two questions I will let Matt, Matt answer on the EEA and uh, cost fluctuations. Yeah, thanks for the reminder because I was <laughs> thinking those through. Yeah, as for the EEA, um, it's it's a great question. They're moving relatively slowly around these specifications. Uh, as far as what the what the merge will do to the EEA spec, the answer is not much. Uh, as the EEA spec is is sort of based around consensus mechanisms loosely, but it's mostly based around you know the pr privacy functionality and permissioning functionality. Uh, as to that, I don't have a great answer. I can circle back though uh, and and see if if that's still valuable. I will I'll definitely uh, make a note to follow up on that. And as to the third one, um, yeah, I think that that's an absolutely great question when when discussing with enterprises and institutions is, is how do we get around, not get around, but how do we engage things like gas fees in a way that makes sense uh, and scalability concerns, which are also very valid. Um, and, you know, there are a number of things that I, I like to point to. I think that one of the great ones is, is the Palm Network. You know, it's a side chain that, was, that, it, that runs for NFTs with the intention of being sustainable. 
and the intention of lowering fees. And the users only pay a fee to bridge back to mainnet. And I think that we are going to see some of these kind of side chain environments proliferate where if there's a consortium or even a single entity that wants to work with public networks, they can build kind of their own little world that has uh, bridging functionality to mainnet and back to allow users to port their assets between the two fun between the two locations with predictable gas or with at least the caveat that you know there is no gas over here there's no fees over here but there are some fees over here depending on what you want to do i think that a lot of the developments around layer two scaling solutions that are going to continue to, to ramp up um you know the first kind of round of layer two roll-ups were based around you know some one set of technology called optimistic rollups but I believe we're about to see an explosion of, of second generation roll of technologies based around zero knowledge proofs. And I think that as these proliferate a lot more, we'll see in general fees come down across the board. Uh, that again, that doesn't address things like volatility, but you know, there are stable coins do exist. And you know, there are improvements to Ethereum in the works around things called you know, multi-dimensional gas or, or network specific gas where I can pay potentially for fees in stable coins. So I know how, or have a predictable model of how things work depending on network traffic, or if I can work, you know, go to a layer two to get my own scaling uh, for a much more predictable or lower fee. But these are all problems that are actively looking to be addressed. And we need to understand the bet, we need to better understand the institutional requirements themselves, I'd say, before we're ready to kind of tackle those as a community. Because again, it's 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 a little bit more complicated than just saying the fees are high. Uh, the fees are high if you do things in certain ways. The fees are low if you do things in other ways. Uh, but there are trade offs, of course, to each uh, around you know security, liveness of data, uh, data availability. It's 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 really a mix and match, and it honestly depends so much on the use case that I I you know want to continue to engage these institutions to really get to the root of of what the issues are there. And predictability of fees is, is not just a, 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 a non-star, it's not just an issue that, that some people are facing, it's an issue across literally every user of the entire network. And it is something that post-merge is kind of, the, the first targets are around scaling heavily the data availability of Ethereum and, and the just the execution throughput. So hopefully we'll see progress there. Um, but I again, I'd point to layer two rollup technologies in the short term. There are also private network rollups and kind of hybrid network rollups. So those aren't exclusive to public chains. And uh, again, kind of this interoperability layer that is looking to be built, which can greatly reduce the burden of fees on users and fees on institutions. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, that, very, very interesting. Actually, there are so many problems. There are research problems for this, for the students is just perfect. Thanks a lot, Matt. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Another question here, Arun. Hey Matt. Um, so another curious question, just to just while you were explaining, I got more curious to now learn about. Uh, is there any specific reason that why Basu community, especially, is looking to, um, like, advertise that public networks are better for enterprises? So from my understanding, I've seen use cases around DeFi and, and and within fintech world, right, mostly who adopt on the public network side, also on the gaming industry. So is there any other use cases such as trade finance or it could be like within supply chain domain that you foresee and why specific push to rock towards that? Just was curious. Yeah, so I think that as kind of some of the fundamentals improve uh, around, you know, things like KYC, AML, uh, throughput and scalability of fees, as we had just mentioned, and things like, you know, just lower cost of value and the infrastructure costs of running on a public network, as these kind of become more known quantities on chain, the, 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 the real cost to implement any of these networks, whether it's supply chain, whether it's trade finance, or a lot of the kind of, you know, traditional blockchain use cases that we've seen across a number of Hyperledger projects, it, it becomes in astronomically less expensive to it and less complex to kind of operate to to iterate and to build out these networks on public infrastructure for a number of reasons uh, but again there there are those there are those few problems to work out and i think that as we get those on-chain fundamentals correct the public network uh at large becomes a a one it is the infrastructure is essentially free in theory you only pay for those fees to use the, the compute time of the network 
But two, it becomes a lot easier and simple to deploy these applications. You don't have to set up nodes or complex consortiums. It's all kind of done on the software layer. And, and that's what we're looking to see is like, if institutions want to get involved from an infrastructure perspective to run their own nodes, to get data from the network, to, to experiment with the network, and then potentially to deploy these smart contracts in the public that will run these supply chain use cases or run those trade finance use cases, use cases with, you know, potentially say, for example, they're using a roll up and they get the privacy that is provided there, or they want to use a specific side chain where, you know, they're, they're selling NFTs related to a certain gaming use case, but they want to make sure that those users can buy and trade and sell NFTs elsewhere, right? We're going to see a proliferation of these kind of unique public focused uh, things where we want users and institutions to be able to access kind of the openness of, of public networks, to be able to access the, the infrastructure of public networks, which already runs today, uh, and to do so in a way that's a lot more predictable. So we're working on the predictability component. Uh, but again, it's, it's, it's mostly rooted in the fact that we've seen struggle around the, the scaling and adoption of some of these consortiums. And I think that's due to some of the barriers to entry around the complexity of the technical setup around the complexity of the permissioning and, you know, kind of access control layer and, you know, some of the complexities of the regulatory compliance. And those are not necessarily lost on the public side. The challenges are just tweaked a little bit. Um, and I think that as we see user experience improve um, on the public network side, we will hopefully be able to convince these enterprises to explore that more and more. And again, that will hopefully lead to a proliferation of more users and more customers on mainnet or even just you know inter-party kind of business to business use cases and that are done in public on a public ledger uh, to to answer your question Daryl, or i don't think i need much more time if unless there's any more questions here sorry arun I, hopefully that was a, a good enough answer there and i'm going over time <laughs> Like I said, I think that the that this has been absolutely great. Uh, there, my email is in the slides that I'm sure will be shared and circulated. Um, so if you have any follow ups that uh, I don't want to take the rest of the time here, uh, please feel free to reach out to me uh, on email uh, and I would be more than happy to go through any of these topics. And I, I think it's a great discussion. And these are all good questions that I want to continue to work through uh, because I don't necessarily think that we should approach this topic as an either or, like either private or public, I think that we really need to be bringing all of these things into the Basu project in a more serious way. Uh, and that's exactly why I, these questions have been absolutely great. They're giving me lots to think about. And I want to continue to engage this group on these topics. And I think that they'll help, you know, definitely drive that message around what are our blind spots with public networks and enterprise and kind of going from there. So I thanks, thanks everyone for the great questions. Cool. Uh, thanks for coming, Matt. It was uh, very informative. Uh, um, not everyone is aware of all of the Ethereum landscape. It's it's growing and changing, and you didn't even cover everything in slides. It's it's crazy large. Um, great. So we'll move on to our next uh, discussion item. Um, we're trying to get uh, some consensus on the proposed charter changes. And if we could bring up the Word doc, uh, not, not the Word doc, the Google doc, charter changes proposal. Um, so before we go into uh, the, the comments that came in after the last edit, I just want to open the floor. Um, are there any questions or comments um, about the TOC proposed changes from people on the call that aren't already captured in the comments since last time? Okay. So um, I detected three when I sorted by comments, that little, uh, little uh, word caption by the pictures of the, um, of the skunk and the starfish. Um, so there's, there's the top three that were new since the last meeting. Uh, the one that came right after the meeting was a question of whether TSC members should vote. And as written, the TSC members um, would not vote in the, the pick of the six. It would only be maintainers. Um, and the, the thesis being that their interest should be represented by the governance vote, the same as non-maintainer contributors. Um, Comments or questions about that or concerns?
Okay, so that was uh, Tracy's comments. The next two are open questions and may require some, some editing of it. Um, the first one was a question from Tracy about uh, our Hyperled Hyperledger Labs to maintainers who vote. Um, I think she had, a, there we go. That link links to the question, how do we get these to link to the doc section? Okay. So to add to maintainers, um, a Hyperledger Labs maintainer, and this would be a change to the charter. So if you start a labs project and you are one of the maintainers of the project, you would have the same level of vote as a maintainer of an admitted project. Um, any comments or questions? Arun's got his hand up. Go ahead, Arun. Not for the current item. I had for the previous item. I guess in okay. the, thanks for thanks for adding more clarification around um, like who can the governing board uh, like nominate or, or elect. So those should be among the nominated members. Right. That's the there third item. No, yeah. Right. Yeah. There is no definition of individuals in, in that I see added. So should we add the clarification of who those individuals are? It just says who are active within the scope of Hyperledger. Okay, that was the third item. Um, I guess we could table these first two items and then just deal with that one directly first, since that one is the one getting comments. So yeah, as it is written right there, it just says um, active individuals. What proposal would you have to define active individuals? Would it be contributors and maintainers? Or should we just let anyone propose themselves to the board, regardless of connection to Hyperledger, and rely on the votes to correct any issues there? Hart? If I can find my mute button, yeah. So I'm fine with anybody. I think if we go outside of the maintainers, then we have to do this whole thing of like, what's a contributor again, which isn't, you know, isn't awesome. And I think our maintainers are probably, uh, probably, you know, smart enough to vote for, you know, people who are involved in the community, you know, except for extenuating circumstances, right? Maybe if Shafi Goldwasser wants to run for the TSC, she should win anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah. Cool. Um, Ryan? Uh, I, no, <laughs> I, I, want, uh, I want people who are maintainers. I mean, yeah, I'm not against it in uh, concept, but it's, it, as Hart just said, once we say you don't have to be a maintainer, I'm super uninterested in having anything to do with elections anymore because it's going to make life hard. So this is not, um, I think we're talking about two things, maintainers who vote versus maintainers who nominate for a seat. Right. So I was thinking if someone nominates them. So are we talking about a person who is not a maintainer being nominated? Was that the right. topic? Right. right. So I'm in theory i'm for that but okay. i would i would like i would not like to have that i i don't want to run those elections because if someone nominates themselves then you have to go in and do the whole you know sci interview thing so um sci sorry uh, yeah it, sorry um yeah you, you'd have to do some some digging to figure figure things out I guess the my guess is the volume of people who do that will be low enough that it won't be terrible, but um, I, I I guess I feel either way, but I, I don't want right. 500 nominations. <laughs> right. So if there are 500 nominations, then it's the, the maintainers who have to pick through those. I'd like to point out that currently on the TOC, the TSC, we do have non-maintainers represented in the TSC, and I think they add value, and I would like them to continue. So personally, I would not be in favor of limiting nominations to just maintainers. Um, so that's, you know, maybe it's something we need to just discuss a little bit, but because um, it looks like there's three levels. There's maintainers only, uh, maintainers and contributors, which would be one way to judge activity or anyone who chooses to fill out a nomination. And yeah, in theory, there could be 500 people that are going to come in on the vote and that's, a, you know, but it's the maintainers that need to assess through that list. And then it would be the governing board that would need us through that list, not the uh, not we would be adding more people eligible to vote. We wouldn't be adding um, it'd be the same list of people eligible to vote in the maintainer selection and the governing board selection. OK, Art? I I withdraw Go my ahead. objection then. So, OK. But yeah, so I think, you know, I, I agree with Rice's point. We don't 
the big thing is we don't want to have to like verify everyone for requirements. And it seems like you're worried about maybe too many people applying. What if we require something very basic like an LFID that prevents people from sort of just spamming a form and that at least if they want to spam us, they have to spend like five or 10 minutes on it. Uh, so our only requirement is an LFID or something like that. Does that make sense? Uh, for me, it, it would, but I don't want to write that into the charter. I, I, I would prefer to just leave this as it is and just people can nominate through a pull request or whatever and uh, would just not spell that mechanism out because I don't want to, LFID might be rebranded as, uh, you know, open LFID or something next year. I, I don't know. What if we had individuals be nominated? Well, they nominate themselves, but would they require um, a second from a maintainer? Would that alleviate any ears? Would that produce too much? Would that change it too much, I guess? No, I, I, that is a great way to do it for me. Okay. Um, and the other TSC members have opinions on this or people on the call who aren't TSC? The second would add additional process, however, and we're trying to simplify the process to the degree possible. Right, but the person doing the second would just edit on their page. Say, hey, I second it, and you could verify who said it. Yeah, OK. Uh, Grace. Uh, I'm, I just know I was the one who asked about the active individuals and uh, after hearing Rai's comment. Um, I think uh, I agree. We don't win the charter. We don't have to have the process or the definition. I think, as Hart said, uh, you know, so it's fine as is, is what I want to say. And then, uh, as Hart said, if it's just a basic uh, LFID to nominate, nominate yourself to be in the TOC. That that sounds reasonable, but we can figure that out later. Okay, Angelo. Um, so, so you, you know, in uh, just to uh, um, more broader uh, the, um, argument. So democracy has a cost. Any election, uh, any any form of government has a cost. So we should not. Uh, I think we should. It's not. It's not very reasonable, or I, I don't buy the argument that says uh, that, that's, uh, it's too much work, so I, we should not do that. Uh, if it makes sense to open up to these people that are non maintainers, because this can be, we find value in them bringing, in bringing these people in, I think if, I mean, the cost should not be a problem. Uh, otherwise, it's better that we say that we think it's not good that these people that are, who are not maintainers come in. Uh, I would better appreciate this uh, this kind of argument but the cost should not be a problem i mean it's like saying if you want to start saying then like something like this you say oh democracy is very costly but it's a still very good system thank you okay um so was there any objection just to limiting it to just individuals who've nominated themselves and write no other process in there and let the process figure it out Not for me. Okay. All right. So let's let's put that on on uh, edit that as one of the ideas for the individual. So the other two questions, the other question was open, um, was whether Hyperledger Labs should be included in the maintainer vote. So if we make a maintainer of a Hyperledger Labs project, be a maintainer. Um, they would then be included in the maintainer vote for selection for for TSC members. What is the uh, what's the uh, opinion on that from the from the people on the call? Thumbs up from Rice. Uh, Hart has his hand up. Well, if no one else wants to say anything, I'll run my mouth some more. Um, I think if they're active, it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think we have a list of active labs and active maintainers and inactive labs and inactive maintainers. And it's great, you know, if we want the active labs to participate in this. Okay. Anyone wants to limit it just to admitted projects and graduated product projects? Okay, so hearing none, um, I think we'll leave the edit for or Hyperledger Labs in it. And if we can go up and do the edit 
I'll do that. I got my own copy here. Individuals and I would propose we just to say individuals. I'm the anonymous badger, apparently, who have nominated themselves for the TOC. Does anyone have any other preferred language, or is that sufficient? Okay. Um, Arun. Hey, um, I thought we were not going to change the wordings and just leave it, leave it the as understanding. Is? Yeah, okay. leave it as is and let, let it let it be understandable kind of a thing. Okay, so active within the scope of Hyperledger Foundation consists of anybody. Okay, so we'll have a very loose interpretation of that. You should probably record that in the notes then that active within the scope of Hyperledger Foundation will have the loosest reasonable interpretation. Okay. Right. So and if there's no the same reason that that Hart mentioned, right? So um, yep. somebody who don't even understand hyperledger should not come and say, "I want to nominate." Okay. Cool. So if there's no changes to this, um, are people okay voting on it today? Is anyone? Is, uh, that's a thumbs up, but. There's some magic words I need to hear. Is anyone going to motion and second for a vote? A motion. I second. second. Okay, there's, okay, uh, right, do your thing. Okay, I'll do a uh, roll call vote here. Uh, Angelo, in the matter before the technical steering committee, how do you vote? Uh, I abstain. Uh, abstain. Uh, Artem? <laughs> Uh, I support. Okay, Arun. I support. Uh, Bobby. I support it. Dano. I support it. David. Aye. Gar <laughs> Grace. Yes. Kim Lesh. Abstain. Uh, Nathan. Oh, Nathan's not here. Peter. Yes. Uh. And Troy's out. So we have it looks like the motion passes to me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have an absolute majority, yes. Hart, you okay. have your hand up. Yeah, I just want to remind everybody that this ultimately this is a charter change, so we have to get the governing board to handle it. Um, so we will take being the Staff and Tracy will take, and others who are on the governing board will take this to the governing board for a final approval. Okay. Just a reminder that nothing can happen until the governing board approves this. Okay. But the majority of the technical steering committee is in favor of the change for yeah. the governing board's information. And we usually find that when the technical steering committee approves something, then the governing board, um, we've never had the, a case where they haven't as well. So. Cool. Until the TSC right. tries to pass a motion saying that the governing board has to buy the TSC free beer. I just want to thank um, We have other. Oh, yeah, I, I just wanted to thank everybody for uh, helping get this done. Thank you all. Cool. Um, we can discuss free beer next week. Um, Arun, you have your hand up. Do we have enough time for your security task force recommendations? Um, probably not, but I just want to add, so add for the recording purpose, right? So um, the proposal looks good to me now that we are planning to bring in the, the, a process change in, in the way TOC or TAC is getting elected. Um, so even though I voted as, the numbers allocated for election versus nomination, or, or I consider whatever governing board elects those members as nominated, those numbers seem that number seems to be still big to me. Uh, the reason being, governing board is very specific representation within Appalachia Foundation. So um, the overall proposal itself looks good, but just the numbers, I'm not sure if that's the right distribution. That's that's all. So the governing board should like more or less. Um, for, from me personally, it was yeah. less, but yeah. Okay. 
because um, when I when I copy this, I copy this from CNCF. Um, the governing board elected the most seats, and then the maintainers selected a smaller, and then there was an even smaller from the end user tab, which was another um, organization to wrangle around, and then they selected two of their own. So, um, yes, I see your concern. Um, can add those notes to the governing board recommendations then. You can see if, because they might, I can see the governing board making some changes there. Hart? Yeah, I was going to say if you have any, if anyone has any comments or suggestions on this, uh, maybe like add it in the wiki or something or, or put in a comment uh, so the governing board can see it all. Because I imagine they will, you know, I certainly think they'll go with the spirit of the proposal, but they may want to tweak things. Um, so if you have things like, hey, we're not sure about the final seat allocation or, you know, stuff like that, definitely please post it um, and it will get brought up in the governing board meeting. Um, was the term of the TOC written in this either? Because I know we discussed going to a calendar year, but I just suddenly realized I don't think it's in here. But the, the term is not written into the charter, is it? No, it's not even today. I think we had it planned that it would be going to the calendar year. Um, I think the original plan was to run the current TSC until through the end of this year and then start uh, Jan 1. But, you know, obviously, okay. if, if people have other suggestions. Um, yeah, we're, we're two minutes late, so we don't have time to discuss it. We can, um, I won't be here next week. So Tracy will be running the meeting as always. Um, but I think that's an excellent discussion to add on to next week's agenda, along with the security task force recommendations. Um, you know, if what we want to recommend, or we could handle it offline on the wiki and just let the uh, let the governing board make a decision. When is the governing board meeting next? September 10th or no, September 11th. Really, it's that late? Uh, they meet. I th I thought it was uh, the second Monday of every month. Okay. Uh, July eighteenth. Yeah, July eighteenth. July, July, but I can't find it. Yeah, it's July eighteenth. Okay. That's right. Okay, so we have this recommendation, but it's not going to go can be considered by the governing board for a vote until the eighteenth of July. So, um, yeah. So there's there's room to amend this if we need to. But I will let Tracy handle that um, next week, as I will be in the middle of Wyoming with no electronics. It's going to be awesome. Um, great. Any uh, closing comments? All right. I'd like to thank everyone for coming today, and uh, it's great to get progress done. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.